Well, a very good afternoon to you all. Thank you so much for joining us um, at the University of uh, Tasmania for our online series for Alumni Explore. Firstly, as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional landowners, the Palawa people and custodians of the land upon which we meet. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Kate Robertson and I'm the Executive Director of Advancement and uh, part of my role um, gives me the great privilege of working with our alumni community and um, a significant part of our alumni program is engaging with alums all over the world as part of this uh, Explore program and it really gives you an opportunity to find out ways in which you can learn something, connect with people perhaps you wouldn't otherwise do. And so regardless of the fact that through COVID, uh, we've been forced to go online, what we found is, is that we've had far more alumni, far more opportunities for people to engage across borders, across countries. And so we're really delighted to have you with us here this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, we want to just run through a few housekeeping notes, if we may, um, just so that you, if you're new to uh, explore, that you understand how this works. Your microphone, uh, camera, chat function and raised hand function, if you know what those things are, uh, they've all been disabled so that um, our speakers are not interrupted during their, their talk. Um, but we do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we really would love to hear from you. And thank you to those of you who did put some questions in, in advance. Um, so to do that, you need to um, type into the Q&A function on Zoom, and you'll see that on your screens. There's a good chance we won't get to all of the questions, um, but we will do our very best. And um, one of the great things is that um, uh, you'll have the opportunity to uh, listen back to this, uh, this webinar um, after the event. Um, and um, so you can, you can go back and, and hear more or share with friends and colleagues um, uh, what you're joining today. Um, so uh, be mindful that also this, uh, this uh, session is being recorded and we will post that to YouTube um, after the event. So we're off to a really great start in um, 2021. This is the first of our um, uh, Explore online uh, alumni uh, lecture series for 2021. And we're absolutely delighted to get off to a great start with two award-winning authors as we discover the power of Tasmania and history in fiction. And so let me begin by introducing those speakers to you. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Rowan Wilson is a writer, teacher and critic. He holds degrees and diplomas from the universities of Tasmania, Southern Queensland and Melbourne. Rowan is the author of three novels, The Roving Party, which is uh, from 2011, To Name Those Lost in 2014, and Daughter of Bad Times, 2019. He's won numerous awards, including the 2011 the Australian Vocals Literary Award, the 2015 Victorian Premiers Award, and the 2016 Adelaide Festival Award. He lectures in creative writing at Queensland University of Technology and his academic research focuses on fiction's difficult relationship with history and the ways in which the Australian novel imagines its connection to the past. Kate Cremant was born in Tasmania and spent most of her childhood in uh, the Huon Valley with an interlude on the West Coast. After completing an arts degree at the University of Tasmania in 2013, she lived and worked interstate and abroad for several years. But today she lives once again in the Huon Valley and uh, she's there now with her husband and daughter. A Treacherous Country in 2020 is her first novel, which won the 2020 Australian Vogels Literary Award. Kate has always loved literature, a passion that inspired her to study English and history at the University of Tasmania, where she now works as an English language teacher. So as you can see, we're in very good hands today. And um, I wondered if um, I could first by saying thank you, Kate and Rowan, for, for joining us and for giving your time um, to share your experiences, your stories and your insights into um, the business of writing a novel and a very, very successful um, time of it you both have had too. Can I ask each of you at what point you knew you definitely wanted to be a writer and how you went about achieving that? Where did it all begin for you? Kate, perhaps I can, I can start with you. There was no definitive point for me. Um... It was kind of a secret. I admitted it to myself, but no one else. And I guess that was to guard myself against disappointment. No one would have to feel sorry for me if it didn't work out. So there was no real point where I thought, this is what I really want and I'm going to give it a go. I always called it a hobby. And then I would just surprise people with a publication if it came along. Ron, what about you? Did you always know you wanted to be a writer? 
Uh, not always, but I do remember very clearly, very, very clearly the day that I, I made that decision. Um, it was in year 10. Uh, I was at Brooks High School in Launceston and I was walking home from school. Um, it was towards the end of the year, you know, you, you graduate in grade 10. It felt, like, it felt like a moment where I had to make some decisions because, I, you know, in theory, I could have just walked away from schooling for the rest of my life and followed my dad, who was a fisherman, you know, or followed my mom, who was a small business owner. And I was walking home from school thinking to myself, like, what could I devote my life to? What would not, like, destroy me? What, what kind of job could I take that wouldn't crush the soul right out of me and leave me feeling hopeless for the rest of my life? And the only thing that when I thought about it sort of filled me with hope was writing. And, and I just, I don't know, I just thought to myself, well, just study writing, just be a writer. How hard can it be? You know, obviously there are writers out there in the world. So I just made that decision and I was like, okay, great. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And, and after that, every decision I made was always sort of putting me on that path, just taking me closer and closer to getting published. And so um, for those of people on this um, uh, webinar who may not know, and I think there'd be a few, but let's just not, not make any assumptions. The Australian Vogels Literary Award is one of Australia's most prestigious awards for an unpublished manuscript by a writer under the age of 35. It offers the prize money of $20,000 plus publication by um, Alan Unwin. And so I'm wondering about the extent to which winning that award, Rowan, made a difference to your life. Was it life changing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was life changing. It, it felt to me, um, you know, the, the day that the Vogel Award Ceremony took place, um, it felt to me like that moment that I can only imagine from stepping out of the Big Brother house, you know, that TV show, you know, the, the, the final contestant steps out, you know, and they're surrounded by people. And that's what it was like. I'd, I'd been locked in my room for years, you know, and then one day I was flown up to Sydney and, and got to attend this incredibly extravagant gala that was full of, you know, writers who I'd admired my entire life, you know, Tim Winton and Kate Morton and all of these, you know, celebrities who were there to, to congratulate me on what I'd achieved. It was a really incredibly life-changing moment. I can't, I can't overstate how, uh, what an amazing experience it was. Yeah. Kate, what about for you? I'm not, I'm not a gamer, despite my dorky gaming headset, but I remember playing Mario on the, um, on the family PC when I was a kid. And, you know, you press the arrow keys and Mario jumps and runs. And if you hit a special token, then temporarily you get to run really fast and jump really high. And I feel like that's kind of what the Vogel does. It kind of supercharges you. It doesn't guarantee you success or a career beyond your first book but it just shoots you straight past all that preliminary stuff, all those barriers and obstacles of finding an agent and submitting to publishers and even getting some attention on your book once you do get published just by virtue of, of winning the Vogel, people are much more inclined to look at it. So it is such a gift. I didn't get the gala because of COVID, <laughs> but I did get the jump start, which was incredible. And you didn't have to be um, keeping it a secret anymore, Kate, that's for sure. Uh, that's the moment where full endorsement, um, your, your career as a, as a professional writer was writ large. That's true, I could admit it. But hey, um, were, you, were you submitting your book to places before the Vogel? Were you sending to agents and, and, and publishers before that? No, I, I wrote it for the Vogel, actually. Yeah, me too. I'd never been rejected. I still haven't ever been rejected by a publisher, which is, like you said, it, it feels like you've skipped all of the, the bad stuff. And, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All that character building stuff. Yeah, all the character building stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that's quite an interesting thing because I, you know, um, many artists set themselves very, um, very ambitious goals, and I'm, I'm wondering about the extent to which it's easy, it's easy having been um, award winners in, in the, in most significant way, how you've encountered the extent to which you've encountered setbacks and dealt with criticism on your way that might have thrown you off course. So clearly, we know now that, um, you know, with with those awards comes, as I say, great, great validation and support, and really sort of sets you up for for, for greater things, but. Have you met setbacks and um, criticism along the way, Rowan? Yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, that's a part and parcel of, of writing. When, when you write when you write a book and put it out into the world, you're joining a conversation. Um, it's especially when you write about contested territory, um, like like the past, you know, especially about mm. brutal aspects of the past, like the Aboriginal genocide that took place in Tasmania. Uh, writing about those and speaking about those is always going to be contested and it's always going to be challenged and rightfully so you know that's that's the process of arriving at the truth isn't it the truth is arrived at 
uh, you know, through contest, you know, through through a tussle. So uh, all you can do as a writer is, um, you know, think clearly and deeply and, and thoughtfully about what you want to say and try to say it as clearly as you can and, and put it down in words that capture what you're thinking, that capture the, the, the facts as you know them and understand them uh, and, and share that, you know, and, and people will read it and respond to it. Some of them will you know, connect with it deeply and, and will feel moved by what you say. And some of them won't connect with it. They'll feel offended. They'll feel upset by what you say. And I don't know, like it's, it's a difficult thing for writers to receive tough criticism. And I've certainly received my share of tough criticism. Some of it, some of it makes you reflect and it does make you change your approach. I've certainly received criticism that made me rethink how I've, how I've approached topics and, and that's good. And I, and I like that. And I, and you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, there's something deeply gratifying about reading a, a piece of criticism on your work written by somebody who has obviously thought long and hard and read closely, read your work closely. Like it's even, even if they have bad things to say, I still appreciate that, that level of engagement. You know, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with criticism that comes from somebody who's read your book deeply and thought about it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, I, I never tire of reading the bad stuff and the good stuff about my own work because it's all it's all educative and I learn from all of it. Hey, what about you and dealing with the setbacks and criticism? How do you how do you harness that? Yeah, I, I really um, agree with what Rowan was just saying about how engaged criticism. I, I think of it as a positive thing if someone has really taken the time with my work and they've seen the good in it, but they've also seen what doesn't work for them and and they're reflected on that, that can only be helpful for me, even if it does wound my pride a bit. Um, that said, I do also like to look at one-star reviews of books that I really love, just to remind myself everyone has a critic. And I've also written <laughs> at least one angry review of someone else's review in response to them, but only in my head. Well, I think it was um, Stephen King who said in his book on writing that his wife was his harshest, harshest critic. So um, the, the, his first drafts always went to her. And I'm wondering if there's someone that, um, Kate, that you, you used for that first kind of tough um, assessment and um, review of your work. Not my husband. He's, he's too close. So I don't want toughness from him. Um, my two brothers are people I really trust. They're both really literary and they both, um, obviously they, they mean well towards me and they're really, really good critical readers as well. So I love showing them my work. Um, as I'm saying this, though, I, I suddenly realised they only ever say positive things. So actually maybe that's why I give them my work. <laughs> Rowan, is there someone that you call upon as you're sort of the, gets the first draft and you, you take it as it comes? I, I do have uh, a couple of close friends who, are, who I send it to, um, but I've, I've tried to train myself over the years to become my own harshest critic. Like I, I, I found that a lot of the time when I send work to people to read it, they tell me things I already know. And, and I've, I think that's useful. You know, you want to, you want to hear that you're on the right track. You want to know that your instincts are correct. So it's good to have that reinforcement, but I've also tried to train myself to, um, act on the things that are making me sort of nervous or uncomfortable about the work when I read it, you know, because nobody knows knows the work in more detail than I do. So I should be able to, I, you know, this is what I tell myself anyway, I should be able to spot the flaws in it before anybody else does. So, um, yeah, it, that's, I'd like to think that I'm my own harshest critic, um, but it's good. It's definitely good to have those, those early readers there in, in your pocket that can read and, reinforce um, your own ideas. And sometimes they will point out things that I haven't thought about, which is always really, really useful. I wonder if I can um, ask both of you about um, Tasmania as the source of inspiration for your writing. It's such a strong part of, um, of your writing and, and how your own background um, has informed that. So depicting the Tasmanian wilderness and bringing it to life in your writing. I mean, was it going to um, be any other way? I mean, was it any way in which Tasmania was not going to come through in your in your books? Um, perhaps Rowan, you could you could start by responding to that. Each book is a little different. Uh, with the Roving Party, my first novel, uh, that book is about um, a, a bounty hunter called John Batman, uh, who was paid by the government to uh, you know track down, round up, kill, capture 
as many of the, the local uh, tribes people around Ben Lomond as he was able to do. So that book necessitated a deep engagement with the country. Um, I, I was really lucky when I was researching the Roving Party that I could draw on the work of Professor Bill Gamage, who was um, a historian from uh, ANU. And he'd spent a lot of time in Tasmania charting out the, uh, the, the fire stick pastures that have been created um, by the Aboriginal Tasmanians. You, you can still see the remnants of those pastures in Tasmania today. They, they still exist. And Bill Gamage was able to sort of, you know, with photographic evidence and with, and with um, uh, all sorts of historical research and with his own sort of, um, you know, just instinct for what was going on, he was able to show that um, the, the extent of these pastures, what they look like, what Tasmania would have looked like, you know, when the first settlers arrived, what, what the island um would have been like and that was just really incredibly eye-opening for me it you know tasmania was um they, the early settlers described it as like a parkland you know it was wooded areas heavily wooded areas interspersed with great big huge um green grasslands like just like parkland and it was possible to to ride um a horse and cart all the way from hobart right to launceston you know just without any roads being there because the the, um, you know, the land was so open and clear. So that really, you know, learning that and reading about what the early countryside looked like was really, really deeply uh, influential on, on my work. And um, I wanted that to come through. I wanted, I wanted that, um, you know, the, the idea that the landscape was created, you know, that the landscape was under Aboriginal management and under Aboriginal control and was not a wilderness at all. It was not a wilderness. It was, it was very clearly um you know tended loved um you know it was it was home to people um and that that idea i think that idea is is a little bit absent i think in in the in the general discussion around the landscape in tasmania we, the word wilderness is thrown around way too much in tasmania it's a wilderness you know if you're if you're from another country it might look that way but certainly if you've lived there in tasmania and and your family had been there for generations as the aboriginal tasmanians had it was um, a neighborhood, you know, it was, it was very well known. It was named, it was familiar. It was, um, it, it was, it was, it, it gave you life. Yeah. So that was the idea that I really wanted to capture, I think, um, in the roving party. Thank you. And Kate, I'm just interested to explore a little bit about the place of Tasmania in your writing. Yeah, I think there's something, there's a, there's a kind of distinction in being from a small place, just by virtue of it being small, you know, you share it with relatively few other people, especially when it's an island like Tasmania. And so I think that kind of molds onto your identity quite early if you're from a place like that. And it might be a positive or a negative thing. You might have a reaction against it, um, as, as I kind of did for a while. I couldn't wait to leave and I went away for quite some time, but it's, it's a formative part of you in a way that I think being from Sydney or Melbourne, you know, where everyone's from is not. And so I wrote to treacherous country um, when I was a really new mum. So I was really, really tired and kind of at the end of my mental resources. And so I, I guess I just went for what I knew, which was Tasmania. I can describe how it looks without doing any research. I, I don't have to visit to know what it looks like. But uh, thinking about, um, you know, writing about colonial Tasmania and, um, again, uh, th there's a sort of a sensitivity, isn't there, presumably, and, and, and a degree of um, uh, risk in uh, merging history and fiction together. And um, presumably that did involve a degree of um, uh, research and care. I mean, one of the, one of the questions that somebody on our... Um, uh, who's who's listening in one wonders about that of how do you how do you use real events or um weave in people into a work of work of fiction and um the extent to which you're using real places real names or fictional places fictional names and and, and does that matter when you're writing a novel can, can you really take full license to, to write whatever you like when you're you're dealing with some sensitive issues and some sensitive places i don't think you can take full license no because because writing is such a powerful thing. And I think it's entirely possible to change the way people think of reality of the real lived past. 
and of people's motivations and people's thoughts. I think it's really easy to ascribe motivations that weren't necessarily there or to create things in people's minds that didn't happen, which can alter the way they consider the real world around them. So I, I do think there is a responsibility there to, as you say, take care and to research. One of the things I love about Kate's book is, is that it does feel so real though, you know, the, the, that experience of um, just following the characters as they kind of go out into the, the, the loosely populated, the loosely settled parts of the island and they stop at pubs, you know, and have dinner and, and talk to each other. It just felt so real. It felt like I was walking along beside the characters as they were going through that country. It was very, very well observed. You know, it was um, just, it, it gave me a different experience of the island, I think. Like, it, it, it's hard, it's hard. One of the difficult things about writing historical fiction is to try and imagine what it was like at that time in a way that feels true. Um, but yeah, Kate was able to do that incredibly well. And it was just such an entertaining read for that reason. So Rowan, how, how, how do you, Rowan, um, what, what sort of process do you go through then? You do a lot of research clearly um, on that sort of historical element. What, what, what processes do you go through to, um, to, to sort of blur the boundaries between fact and fiction and, and to give such a, a sort of a compelling story? Um, I, there's, a, there's a couple of things I would say there. One is that I don't think fiction is like history. It's, it's a very different approach to the past. It's not, um, I, I, I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to talk about facts in fiction in some ways. Like what, what is the status of a fact when you put it into a fictional you know, a, a, a book of fiction, Does it, is it still a fact or is it, or is it somehow something else? It's, it's a very slippery discussion. And I feel that it's, it's easier in some ways to just consider fiction as being its own separate discourse, its own separate way of thinking about and understanding the past. Um, that helps to avoid some of the slippery problems I find. Um, but one thing that fiction can do that, that historical research can't do is to, is to raise and, and give speculative answers to certain kinds of questions that historians can't answer. Uh, and, and some of those questions, I mean, I, I encountered a lot of holes in the research as I was reading about John Batman and his roving party. You know, they, there wasn't a lot known about uh, William Ponsonby, who was, mm. who was sort of the, the pivotal character in the novel. He was um, an Aboriginal Tasmanian man. He was part of the roving party. We know that he also assisted in the capture of a couple of notorious bushrangers and that he was um, married in a church in Launceston to another Aboriginal woman, and that he was granted land kind of ironically, you know, like the thought of an Aboriginal Tasmanian man being granted land by the governor is a really sort of deeply ugly irony. Um, and we know he was the first Aboriginal Tasmanian to be granted land, but that's really all we know about him. So anything else that I was saying about a character like that was pure invention, pure speculation. Um, so, you know, that, that's the area where fiction can do some interesting work. We can, we can make informed speculations about what these people may have been like, how they may have spoken, how they may have treated each other. Um, they're never really going to be anything more than speculation. Um, but historians aren't able to make that kind of speculation. They're, they are restricted to what they have evidence to talk about, whereas fiction writers aren't. So I think that's the interesting territory for us, you know, how we can make interesting useful, informed speculations about, about the past. I'm just going to remind our um, audience that they can ask questions through the um, Q&A function. So as you're listening to Rowan and Kate uh, talking about um, their, their books and the process of writing and uh, their, um, uh, how they sort of marry up this um, balance between sort of history and fiction, please do put your questions through the Q&A function. We'd love, to, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Kate, I'm wondering when you're writing, how much is the audience, the reader, in your mind when you're writing? Or is this something that you don't think about at all? Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the construct of being conscious of your audience as you're writing. Does that, does that frame and affect how you go about it? It, it never used to um, when I was writing, you know, short stories for journals and things, but now it definitely does working on what I hope will be my second novel after publishing A Treacherous Country and experiencing for the first time that kind of reader engagement that we were touching on earlier. Um, so the audience does pop into my head, but I, I try to squash those thoughts down actually. 
Um, I don't find it useful to me to start speculating about my audience because it, it's such a diverse group of people, isn't it? And you, you can't write something for everyone. Well, maybe some people can. I can't write something for everyone. And so what I've decided with this book is I'm just trying to write for myself. And Ron, what about you? Are you thinking about audience when you're writing? Uh, I, I'm forced to think about audience when I'm writing because I teach writing as well. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and most of what we do in, in teaching creative writing is trying to trying to teach students to be aware of the audience and to think about how certain decisions that you make in your work will affect people who are reading. And and it's, it is a very, very complicated and difficult thing for a writer to, on the one hand, pursue your vision you know you, you we, we know what we want to write we know what we want to say and and to pursue that relentlessly but on the other hand to moderate that when you need to in order to make it understandable for a general readership so it's it's always a balancing act i find um because the danger in considering your audience too much is that you get drawn back towards the center you get drawn back towards the um the lowest common denominator for want of a better term you know you, you it, it's if you look at widely available commercial fiction you know the stuff that you buy at the airport um it has a, a sort of a reading age of around 12 to 13 years old you know it's it, they don't they, they avoid complicated words they avoid complicated vocabulary they avoid complicated ideas they avoid anything that might upset people um, they avoid controversy all because they are pursuing the widest audience possible um and so you know, the, the work that Kate and I write is not like that at all. We're very, very different to the airport thriller writers. Um, and so I think, I think we, perhaps less than other kinds of writers, you know, give less consideration to our audience and more consideration to what we want to say and what we want to do. And um, I think that that means, in my case, certainly it means I'll always be a fairly niche writer because I'm mm -hmm. pursuing my own interests and I'm pursuing my own ideas and, you know, to hell with the audience in some ways. Um, but it does give you a freedom of another kind, which is a freedom to upset and, and to pursue things that, that are difficult and that are complicated and that do require some thinking and some thought and some patience. Uh, if I've, if I've uh, heard correctly, I understand that um, the roving party sort of came, came to you in the middle of the night and you just had to get it down quickly. If, is that right? That's true. That's a true story. Yeah, I had been reading about... Uh, Tasmanian history a lot for a long time you know and I'd studied history um, as an undergraduate at UTAS and I had for a long time wanted to write something about the Tasmanian past and it it, it took a sort of a weird turn of events to, to push me in that direction I was living in Japan um, in a city called Kobe over there and I was working for a, a giant English language school called Nova and it, it was enormous you know they had uh, 12,000 foreign teachers working there and seven or 8,000 staff. And, it, and it, it slowly over the course of about six months went bankrupt and then ceased operations um, in about 2000, uh, late 2007. And I found myself unemployed uh, on, a, on a work visa living in Japan. And I had to make some pretty rapid decisions about what I wanted to do. And, and it sort of struck me like the story that I'd been reading about a lot, which was John Batman and, and his uh, roving party. Um, it just struck me that that story had stuck with me you know, and it stuck with me and it spoke to me, it was probably going to stick with other people and speak to them as well. So I rolled out of bed, you know, in a state of great anxiety about my own future and just started making notes and jotting it down and, and, and trying to figure out well, how can I tell this story? And yeah, um, I, I just got stuck into it from that day on. And within about six or eight months, I, I had something, you know, that I could sort of loosely read or you could loosely call a draft and um, it, it sort of went from there, but it did, yeah, it, it hit me in the middle of the night. Perhaps not the story, but the courage to write the story certainly hit me in the middle of the night. And have your subsequent novels had, had, had been a different approach? The Extremely sort of... different. Yeah, yeah, very different. Um, I, Daughter of Bad Times emerged just out of the research process. I was reading a lot uh, about uh, climate upheaval, you know, and about a sea level rise and what that was going to mean for certain countries. And I came across this little country called the Maldives, which is south of India. It's um, an, a group of uh, atolls, a group of sand islands, and it is existentially threatened by sea level rise. Um, two, two meters of sea level rise will render the Maldives uninhabitable. That's a, that's a country, a civilization that has their own language, 2000 years of history, uh, which could disappear by the end of the century. So that, you know, coming, coming across these stories in the research I was doing prompted me to start 
down that direction. Um, so a very, very different process to, to the roving party, that's for sure. Each book is different. Each book arrives in its own unique and interesting way, I think. Mm. And, and Kate, I'd love to um, hear more about um, your experience of writing your debut novel. And I think you mentioned um, earlier that you, you also had some uh, you know, additional challenge, young, um, having your baby just a few months old. So regardless of whether something came to you in the middle of the night, then there were actually some, also some practical things that you had to presumably think about when you were, you were writing. Tell us, tell us how um, A Treacherous Country was managed to come to fruition. It, it's funny because the treacherous country was the kind of the thing that I used to manage myself. I was pretty lost as a new mum. I was really shocked by the experience of new motherhood. I hadn't really understood how sedentary it was and how lonely it could be and just how tired you get. I was hallucinating. So I was having this really physical and really emotional experience and I could sort of see my intellectual self kind of bobbing around up there and I just wanted to, to grab her by the ankle and just find a connection. So I Googled the Vogel, it was about eight months away, the deadline, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna use this as an exercise. I'll write something specifically for this um, and it will give me a bit of structure, it will give me an external deadline. And afterwards, then at least I'll have something that I've completed and later I can come back to it and look at it and you know see if there's anything in it. So yeah, it was a bit of a logistical challenge. I mean, there is a lot of sitting down, but you know, I usually had the baby on my breast, so I'd sort of be typing like this, or um, maybe I might escape for an hour and go to a cafe and do a bit more writing. But um, you know, people do ask me how I managed it with a new baby, but but really, it was the thing that that kind of kept me sane in that period. Thank you. Now, um, actually, I'm pleased to see that we've got a couple of questions um, coming in live um, from our audience. So if you're good with this, uh, Rowan and Kate, I'd just like to um, start opening it up to um, those people who have joined us. So um, Sally Crane asks a question for Rowan. You mentioned that writers of historical fiction can make informed speculations of past events and character motivations. How did you go about that in relation to Tasmanian Aboriginal characters? Did you consult with the Aboriginal community to ensure your narrative would not cause conflict or upset? I did consult with the community, yeah, I did. And I, I did um, a lot of research trying to piece together what uh, Aboriginal culture was like in 1829. And there is there is quite a bit, we, we know, not everything, but we do know quite a lot about, about what um, traditional culture looked like in 1829. And, um, I was able to, you know, use that research to feed it in, but also to speak to the community. Um, uh, one of the people I spoke to was um, an elder up here in the north, um, and she was able to take me out onto her country and show me. Um, she she had a a, um, a piece of ochre, uh, which she had ground up with some stones that she'd been gifted by the museum, actually. Um, that were that were ha that had been used by her community, um, you know, 150 or more years ago. Uh, so that was a real, real eye-opening experience. You know, sitting there holding a piece of ochre, holding these stones that had been used for for ceremonial purposes so many times, uh, and watching her, you know, um, grind ochre. Yeah, just little things like that. There are there are a lot of moments um, throughout the creation of the book that. Um, it's difficult, you know, it's, it's impossible for anyone to know what it was like to live in 1829. And especially in particular, it's impossible um, to know what it was like to live on, on the Aboriginal side of the frontier in 1829. Um, so much of that is lost and is and can never be accessed um, in any way. So it's, it's a difficult challenge, but you do get those moments of insight where, where you learn and, and where you understand or you think you understand what it may have been like. And that's about the best you can hope for as a writer, I think. We have a, a related question that um, Jack Tan asks, which um, for, for both um, you and um, Kate, which is that in writing about Tasmanian native um, Aboriginal cultures, how do we build bridges across these cultural differences and similarities to be more encompassing and or protect some values that are that are unique? You know, so you know, are, are differences to be celebrated in current political climate all over the world? That's, again, sort of some really interesting things there coming through from Jack. Difference is a, is a really important one, and I'm glad he raised that because 
it, it, one of the difficulties about as a, as a white writer writing about Aboriginal culture is that you tend to uh, you tend to erase the difference. You know, you you see things from your own perspective. You see things from through through a white cultural lens, through a privileged lens, and you tend to want to erase the differences that are there rather than embracing or, or pointing out or highlighting. Um, or you know, well, I guess the other problem is that it's almost impossible to know what those differences are unless you've lived in indigenous culture um, and so you just can't see them you're kind of blind to the differences i think that's that's a real risk and it's a real danger for writers who are working in this area um, how you overcome that well research is is perhaps the best tool we have as writers we we need to embed ourselves in those cultures and, and try to understand them as much as we can before we start writing and i mean necessarily we're going to get it wrong um, i don't think there's any way for I don't think there's any way to write across cultural boundaries authentically. It's always going to be a little inauthentic. It's always going to be incorrect in a lot of ways, and it's always going to be speculative. Um, but the process, that, that process of engagement and the process of trying to do that and of trying to understand and of trying to communicate across cultures is in, so incredibly vital that I think it's a mistake for writers to withdraw from that and to stop doing it altogether. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's my way of thinking about it anyway. Kate, I wondered if you wanted to, to expand on that at all. I think the perspective of your book is also relevant, you know, if it's a sort of omniscient narrator that is diving into the minds of everyone, or in my case, it's a first person narration and the narrator is quite a, a blinkered, ignorant person. I think in that way you can represent difference as perceived by someone who doesn't understand well in a critical way to kind of examine that perception of the time that is so blinkered. It's, it's important as well, Kate, isn't it, for, for people in the 21st century, when we look back at the people from the 19th century, it's, it's sometimes hard for us to understand why they did the things they did or why they acted the way they acted. I mean, it's, it's 200 years, which is a lot, but it feels like a lot more than that. It feels like they're, they're quite alien to us, doesn't it? And, Trying not to erase that that kind of difference as well is sometimes a challenge. I find. Absolutely, and such a fine balance between representing that and representing it critically, you know, examining it as you're representing it, it rather than just showing this is how it was. Because I guess there's the danger of, you know, in representing that voice that, that becomes the voice. Absolutely, completely agree. Um, uh, Frances um, Schifferli, who I may have mispronounced your surname, so apologies for that, but has asked a couple of questions. If I just take um, uh, one of them, uh, she says, I was struck by the vividness of metaphor used in both your books. Uh, how much time do you give crafting your descriptions and figures of speech? Kate, I wondered if you would like, like to take that first. I kind of struggle with the word writer because I feel like, for me at least, the vast majority of, of what we call writing isn't writing at all. It, it sort of happens in my head. So I'm quite an observational person. I think all writers probably are. But those descriptions usually form in my head when I'm not writing. So I might be walking, I might be talking to someone else, I might be reading something else. And so I think they, they go from my head into the story, finding the logic of the story in quite a fluid sort of natural way. And so I don't necessarily think, okay, the whale is a metaphor. I, do, I put the whale in there and the story will tell me if it's a metaphor or not. I, I did wonder a little about the whale myself as well in your book. <laughs> I, I, I scratched my head. I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredibly powerful and useful image, isn't it? And it means so much. It means something different to each character, I suppose, doesn't it? And that's, and that's what makes it a great metaphor. Yeah. Thanks. And it, it's quite loaded with um, the canon as well. You know, people talk about Moby Dick, but there's also the Bible, there's Jonah and the whale and so on. When I had an, an interview in the really early days when my book had just come out, the, um, the interviewer who was wonderful, she, she said, oh, and the whale is a metaphor, of course. And I said, of course, hoping desperately she wasn't going to ask me what for. <laughs> Well, the best metaphors are hard to pin down. You know, if, if it was easy to pin down and it only had one meaning, it would not be a particularly interesting <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rowan, your third novel, Daughter of Bad Times, um, has moved away from your first two novels on Tasmanian history to sort of compelling um, vision of uh, a global future. 
And and so I'm wondering how different that was to write about um, a very futuristic Tasmania and world. History and science fiction, well, the, the, you know, from, from a writer's point of view, from a fictional point of view, writing the writing of history and the writing of science fiction are very closely related. They're very close cousins to each other. Um, you have to go through a similar sort of research process to do both. And you're speculating, you know, you're, you're using your research as a jumping off point for, you know, looking for those gaps and those holes in the research. And that's, that's where you are able to speculate. So that the process of writing them is very, very similar, but the outcome is very, very different, I think. And one of the difficult things about writing about the future was trying to do it in a way that felt true. You know, writing about the past is um, in some ways easier because if you want to know how people dressed or how they spoke, you can just look it up. But writing about the future, um, you know, get you, you really just, you're on your own. You've, you've got, there, there are some things we have, like we know, for example, I was writing a lot about climate change and we, we have pretty good projections that, that can tell us, you know, 50, 60, 100 years from now, um, what, what the climate will look like, the habitable zones on the planet and how, how cities are going to be affected. We know quite a lot about that. Uh, we know quite a lot about demographic change. We know quite a lot about um, how cities will change. Um, the big picture stuff, we kind of know, but when you get down to the, the human level, how do people speak and act? Or what are they worried about um, You know, in the year 2075, which is when the novel is set? Those things were a real challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that stuff, I don't know, it, it's fun to write and it's fun to speculate, but it really was hard work. It, it was the most challenging book I've written. And it, um, I don't know, my, my approach was just to try to focus on just a, a couple of small things. Like I, I just tried to keep each character focused on one or two things so that my speculations didn't sort of grow out of control. I didn't, I didn't want to end up having to write about what if robots were here or what if, what if flying cars were here. I wasn't interested in any of that. I tried to keep it as narrow as I could. Um, and that was my way of dealing with, with the, the endlessness, the, the infiniteness of the future. And Kate, of course, we don't yet know what's coming next um, for you. Are you able to give us any sneak peeks about whether you're continuing in a similar direction or in, in, in some different way with your next novel? Uh, it's, it's pretty different in most ways. Um, I've been really inspired to write about organ donation, actually. My mum died in 2017 in a really shocking way, not because it was gruesome, but just because it was really sudden. But it was also a way that made her a really good organ donor. I hadn't known before that, but it's actually quite rare to die in such a way that you can donate your organs. And there is just such richness there. You know, there's, it was this huge dark cloud of my mother dying, but then with this incredible silver lining that there are now six people who are just as precious as she was, even though I don't know them. And they're alive because of her, or, you know, they can see because of her. There was young man, one young man who was on his deathbed, we were told when my mum died. So there's cognitive dissonance there. I wish she were alive, but also I'm really glad that those people are also alive. And then when you start thinking about the details of it, you know, like what, what's the role of muscle memory in a new pair of lungs? What's the relationship between the donor and the person who's received the donation? So basically I'm writing about two sisters and, and one of them dies, but with that as the, the background and the context. Oh, that sounds like something we will all be looking forward to. When when might we get to see it, um, read it? Oh, who knows? <laughs> We're going to be drawn on that. <laughs> Sometime, hopefully. Oh, and um, Rowan, what are you working on at the moment? Can you share with us? I can, yeah. I'm, I'm working on a book uh, about uh, an academic. She's, she's a lecturer at a university in Brisbane, kind of like me. <laughs> yeah. Um, she, she's a sort of vehicle for me. Like it's, it's, it's very, very loosely, very, very loosely autobiographical. We share some, we share some similarities in our, um, in our backstory, but we're very different people. So obviously she's female and I'm, and I'm a male, um, but she's also alcoholic, um, sort of to quite self-destructively alcoholic as well, um, which I'm certainly not. So um, there's that difference. And it's just been fun. It's a comedy. Um, you know, she, she drinks too much and gets herself into a lot of really bad situations and into a lot of trouble. Um, and it's just been fun writing about someone who's kind of like me. I don't have to do any research for this book. It's amazing. I can just write. Uh, 
but it's also been fun writing comedy as well, like putting somebody in bad situations and watching them squirm and watching them try to get their way out of it is, is quite fun from a writer's point of view. As you were just speaking, I was thinking back to the question we had um, uh, submitted in advance from, from um, one of the audience that was asking around using real events and people um, and um, do you have to inform that person? So I was thinking when you're just talking about your alcoholic uh, academic whether that's actually modeled on anyone and whether you've had to be very careful to make sure it doesn't sound like anyone that, that might think this about there well i think i think the real danger is that people are going to think it's me you know because that's <laughs> <laughs> you know there's I, I i can live with that I, I don't i don't worry too much about what people think about me but it's it's going to be i mean there are there are people in the novel who are you know based on people i know and that kind of thing and it's, it is going to be a challenge it's going to be difficult to manage that think um i don't know i don't have a strategy for that yet i'll have to think about it as it, as it gets closer to being finished yeah. um, so a, a lot of people i think who come on to um our, our webinar are sort of interested in that sort of um the mechanics and the sort of process of writing and i wondered about the extent to which um both of you plan the process of writing so how much time do you allocate to to research and then to drafting and then to editing is is, is that a very deliberate and sort of structured uh, way which you go about things or I mean I don't know I'm not a writer but I'm just I think that our, our um, listeners will be really interested in hearing how you organize yourself to, to write. Kate I wonder if you could you could take that first. Such an interesting question that it's such a funny question for me because you know I wrote a treacherous, a treacherous country in quite extreme circumstances for me so I, I used the structure of the deadline of the Vogel and the minimum word count, which was 30,000 words, to get myself over the finish line. And um, after that, when they said I'd won, they, they also said I needed to double the word count in a couple of months. So that was another good, strong deadline for me to work towards. So I think for me, it's really just goal setting. Um, Rowan actually very kindly suggested the Pomodoro technique once when I asked him about how to stay focused when writing. And I find that so helpful. You set yourself a timer for 20 minutes and you can do nothing but write for that 20 minutes. It's achievable, it's small, and then you can have a little break or you can keep writing. And I also try and set myself a 500 word limit per day. So I really just set myself little goalposts and try to reach them. Yeah, Pomodoro is the way to go. It's so, <laughs> so doable. It, there's, you, you, there's no excuse. Anyone can write for 20 minutes. That, it's, it's an easy thing to do. And I find I can get you know, two, 300 words done sometimes in 20 minutes. And I, like Kate, I try to set myself 500 words a day. I think if you can do 500 words a day, you can get a draft of a novel out in about three months or four months if it's a long one. Um, and that's, you know, that's really doable. Any, anyone can do 500 words a day. It might only take you an hour or an hour and a half, maybe two hours to do 500 words if it's a, if it's a slow day. Um, anyone can do that. You, you can have a full-time job. You can have a family. You can have a life and still write that much per day. Um, it, yeah, it's, I think part of the, part of the difficulty with writing is people seem to think you need a whole day to do it, or you need, you need hours and hours of free time uninterrupted. And I don't think that's true. I think professional writers, people who've been doing it for a long time can write anywhere, can write for 10 minutes, five minutes, one hour. It is a luxury. Sometimes it's great to have that whole day where you can focus, but it's not, it's not necessary at all. Um, People, people use time as an excuse to avoid writing, I think, more than anything. So um, learning to write anywhere for any amount of time is, is a really key skill for writers. Is, um, is where you write important? Is it, is, is the, you know, you have, uh, as a non-writer, you have sort of romantic notions of you know, a special studio or a, a, a desk that only, you know, only comes to you when you're sitting at this desk. Is, is place important? Uh, it can be. Um... I, I used to have an office when I was in Tasmania. I had a I had a whole room to myself and it was such a luxury. I really miss having that space now. I don't anymore. I'm sitting here, you can see this is my kitchen behind me. This is, this is my office is in my kitchen now. So I've been writing, I've written two novels sitting here in this office and slash kitchen. Um, and I would love to have space to be able to work, but it's not essential and it doesn't stop me from getting work done. Um, but it, it would be a nice luxury to have. Okay, what about you? Where do you like to write? I'm a writer in cafes, really. I like to have a little bit of distinction between home and writing. You know, home, I, I love my house, but it gets me down a bit. The skirting boards aren't finished, it's messy, and I've got a three-year-old who is the boss of me. And so it's, it's nice to just leave and 
it's also a bit psychological because I've made the effort of going, I've arranged someone to look after my daughter, I've paid for a coffee and a muffin. So, okay, no excuses, I, I have to write now. The, the routine side of things is probably the most important, isn't it? You know, if you, if, you, if you can do the same thing every day, day after day, the routine starts to take care of itself. When you, when you sit down, you've got your coffee, you've got your muffin, um, the noise of the cafe is going, it, it just triggers something and, and you, you, you're in the zone and you can write. I, I, I find the same thing. If, as long as I do it at the same time in the same place every day, I get into the routine and, and, and the habit takes over. Yeah, absolutely. And then that, that small 500 word goal, which is so achievable, it's almost, you know, I almost hesitated setting it for myself because it seems too small, but it's beautiful because you can always write more. But even if you only write 500 words, that's enough. You've achieved for the day. That's right. And it's a good feeling to get your 500 words done and out of the way and then have the rest of the day off. So. <laughs> There's a real incentive. There's a real incentive. Look, another uh, interesting question's come up. I like this one. Um, should all books, including yours, be made into films or Netflix series, or are some books not suited to these media? Um, just mm -hmm. that's, a, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Given our, you know, we're all binging on, on Netflix and um, certainly on the screen these days. God, I would, I would love to make one of my books into a movie. That's always been my dream, but uh it, movies movies are a, a very 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 different process to books because they involve they're, they're made by committee basically you know that there are people all the way along who have more decision making power than the author so uh, the, the the thing about getting your book made into a series is that you lose control of it and it, and it becomes controlled by people who are very very deeply concerned about the audience and how they will react and what they will think and that can sometimes be the death of artworks um, so, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword, I guess, you know, I've, I've been through that process. The, the film rights to the Roving Party did sell early on and we, and we wrote a couple of, uh, like two or three drafts of, of the screenplay we went through and it was fine, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same book. It was different. You know, the ending was different and the characters were a little different and it, it wasn't my story anymore. And mm. that sort of taught me a few things about the process and, uh, I've I've lost a little passion for it since then. I think um, the, re the the reality was a little different to the to the romance of um, having a having a film. Yeah, one thing I would love to I would love to write specifically for mm. the screen. That would be an amazing opportunity. But I'm a little bit hesitant about adaptation. Yeah. yeah, Kate, what about you? Would you like to see your your book turned into onto the screen? Uh, yes, <laughs> um, but. I think I would have to just let it go if that were to happen. I don't think I'd want to be involved in the script. I don't think I'm brave like you, Rowan. And I, I feel in a way that, that film is a much more limited medium in a way than, than the written word because you lose all that interiority. I, I guess there's voiceover, but a novel is so freeing. You can write whatever you like. You can write every thought that every character has and... Was that a challenge, Rowan, trying to translate that interiority into the screenplay? It's, it's incredibly difficult because you're trying to communicate what people are thinking and feeling through body language, which good screenwriters are able to do. You know, they're very good at that. Um, I'm less good at that. I'm less skilled at that. And, and sometimes, you know, like in internal states of characters in fiction can be very complicated and very, very um like full of anxiety and full of full of a kind of tension and bringing out complicated inner emotional states through body language or through conversation sometimes just you're right like you lose something there but, but there is a there is a, a very fundamental difference between fiction and film um which just for, for writers just never it's very difficult to bridge that difference yeah i, I really admire what filmmakers are able to do but it's a different way of writing. It really is. Well, look, we're getting very close to the end of our session. So I'm going to give both Kate and Rowan sort of uh, due notice of the last question, um, which is if you could give um, advice to any aspiring writers, what would be the most valuable piece of advice you'd give? So just hold that thought for the moment. But the, 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 the sort of penultimate question, which again, may be a tricky one because both of you teach and it's wonderful that you do, but do you think that storytelling is an innate talent or something that can be taught? Oh, I've got a lot to say about this one. This is, <laughs> this, 
this is a, this is a question that comes. You know, as a teacher of writing, this is a question that comes up all the time. Um, it's very common to hear people say that uh, you're either born as a writer, like you're born with the talent, or you're not. You don't have it. I've I've heard many. I've heard people like Salman Rushdie say that. You know that that you're either born with it. Some writers have got it, and some writers haven't. And and there is some small element of truth to that. Like talent certainly factors in, but having taught a, a great number of students now over a great many years and seeing many very talented students do nothing and go nowhere and very a great number of students who had very little talent get there and make it and succeed. Um, I don't think talent is particularly useful. I think the most important thing is ambition and just not giving up. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're prepared to stick at it and keep working at it, you will get there eventually. Um, and talent will help you. Talent might make the, the journey a little bit easier or a little bit quicker, but it's certainly not going to hold you back if, if you're if you're less talented um, i'm not particularly talented at anything and i've managed to get three novels published so um i'm, I'm a i'm a poster boy for that uh but it, it is certainly the case you can you can teach the basic fundamental skills in writing there's no question in my mind there are there are certain things that are there are certain um skills techniques and and properties that writing has that's common across all writing um in all cultures in all times and it's those things are easy to pick up. They're easy to pick up. It just takes practice. So, yeah, I, I really think you can teach it and you can learn it. What do you think, Kate, this sort of balance between, I guess, it's a sort of a nature versus nurture kind of question. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it's interesting. And, and I don't teach creative writing, so please take Ron's answer with all weight and mine with none. But I, I do feel that you kind of always know if you're going to be a writer. You have that idea in your head. I think maybe more than anything, it's a personality. Maybe you hold yourself back a little bit rather than fully participating and observe rather than joining in. And I think that 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 tendency or that personality trait can certainly be drawn and directed. Um, You know, reading, for example, reading is such a great teacher, isn't it? All right. Well, thank you both of you for that. So that just leaves me with um, uh, what I hope is a a short fire answer because uh, we're we're now running uh, to time. Um, So Rowan, if you could give aspiring writers one bit of sage advice, what would you, what would you, you give them about um, becoming uh, an author? Um, Do it every day. Just, just write every day. No, no one's, the, the quickest way to get there is to do it every day. And, and the more you write, the more you learn and the more you improve. And it's like any other physical skill. It gets better the more you do it. So um, just do it. Just do it, do it every just day. Do it. Kate, what about you? What would you advise? Um, read for inspiration and observe the inspiration and use that inspiration as a jump start to do your own thing rather than a continuation of what you've just read or seen great advice really really wonderful session we've had with both of you thank you so much and i'm sure that to um all of the um people that we have got on um uh, on the session this afternoon and indeed to the people who are going to be listening afterwards thank you so much for your time for being so open um with your thoughts and reflections um and indeed um advice so thank you to um rowan wilson and to uh, kate Cromick, and we'll be sort of silently um clapping uh, on our, our screens um and i think you know just this afternoon we've just seen a wonderful example of the expertise we have here through our alumni community um and um indeed our staff at the university of tasmania thank you for getting our series off to such a great start my pleasure really enjoyed it thanks so much um, so the um, the recording of this afternoon's presentation will be available um, soon on YouTube and um, you can access that through the Explore website and the link is now on your screens. Um, and soon you'll also get an invitation to join in our next uh, webinar um, event uh, on a very different topic. It's on Tuesday the 8th of June and it's uh, with Sue Ellen Taylor who is a Change and Organisational Development Specialist and she will be offering insights on adjusting to change as we navigate through our work and day-to-day to lives and despite the fact that we sort of think of COVID as over we are all still adapting so it's a very topical um, 
uh, opportunity for you to join with us. If there are other topics you would like us to explore, please do write in and let us know. We very much frame these things around the demand that we have from our alums and the topics that you're interested in. Um, so do um, do that through the um, the alumni office and you can do that and you can see on your screen uh, the place that you should write to for that. So thank you once again for being here. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Rowan. Have a great um, afternoon, if indeed it is afternoon, wherever you are um, or whenever you're watching this uh, webinar. But thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.